I just got in from the movies and I thought I would just go ahead and get after it with Boundaries, the latest chapter. And I know I look so funny, but I'm still cold. It is cold here in San Diego. It is very cold. So, all right. I found out that um, the boundary stuff that I read last night, it actually didn't record it at all. So I thought I would, or it did record it, but I didn't have the audio. So we're revisiting boundaries. This is chapter 10 in boundaries. It's boundaries in your children. And this is a great way to start off the new year. If you've wondered what boundaries were or how to do them well, um, this this book has so much information that it's, it's almost overwhelming. So I do this book with the workbook. Um, which are available on Amazon, and I did not, obviously, I did not write them, if you're not familiar. Um, It's Dr. Henry Cloud and John Townsend, Um, but I love their their material so much that it has completely changed my life, and um, I used to say this a lot at the beginning of my 30-day challenge that um, the most important thing in the whole world to me is to love God and love others. And so um, a couple years ago when I had a major crisis with a family member, um, they felt totally unloved. And I was like, oh my gosh, something is terribly wrong because I love this person just more than anything and more than anyone. And I'm doing everything in my power to love this person and they don't feel loved. So um, for me, that was just like this huge, really painful wake up call that the way that I was doing relationships wasn't, there was something wrong. And um, through that, um, I had a couple of different things recommended to me and boundaries. uh, The book was recommended to me. And then from that, I got the workbook because I'm a really slow learner. I have to experience things. I have to write about them. I have to do like all kinds of stuff before content really sticks. So um, I got the workbook and then I was praying for a supportive community to really learn how to love well. And um, then the the church that I grew up in that also was just a few blocks from where we were living, um, they did a nine-week class on boundaries in a Sunday school class. And the class was packed. There were probably 60 people there every week working through this material. Um, And uh, at the end of it, the class ended and I was like, this needs to keep going. And um, I didn't have anybody around me who wanted to keep going with it because it's really hard. It's really, really hard work. Um, But I knew that if I was going to love my family well, that I needed to keep working on this stuff. So so I kept going with it, and it's been three and a half years since then, and I've launched a coaching business where kind of the foundation of all the coaching I do comes back to the treasures of your soul, which are the uh, characteristics that I discovered through this book. Um, So I would love to share that with you more. If you'd like more information, I'd be happy to send you that list of the things that only you are responsible for in any relationship, in any work setting, in your family, in any dating relationship. Um, There are just, there's a short list of things that only you are responsible for. And so I've actually like printed out that list and cut it out and put it by my bathroom mirror or any other place that I'm going to see every morning and every night. And with my coaching clients, I tell them like, if they're open to doing this kind of work, because not everybody wants to work on this stuff and that's totally fine. But anybody who is willing to kind of incorporate um, more of an understanding of, okay, what am I responsible for that nobody else is responsible for? Um, That if I don't get this stuff right, nothing else is going to work right. That's what the boundaries represent. So, um, so with those coaching clients who are ready to do that kind of work, I, ha- I encourage them to print out that list as well and put it on their bathroom mirrors so they can remember it. Um, and at the core of it is really because we've been so loved in- by Christ in Jesus. Um, we've been totally and completely loved by him. And so we can know that intellectually, but it's really hard to get that into our hearts. None of us have uh, the perfect wiring from a perfect family. And so um, to incorporate more and more and more of God's love for us, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna take some uh, intentionality is the best way to say it. So without further ado, I'm gonna read uh, some of chapter 10, Boundaries in Your Children. This is a great section and um, I read it last night but the audio didn't record so um, if you can hear me please let me know somehow it would be awesome for you to to comment or give me a thumbs up or a like or something if you can hear me okay Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and read chapter 10 now okay thanks Ashley for the thumbs up okay I know you can hear me and I'm hoping that um, yeah the audio will work better than it did last night I had I had 
technical t- challenges. Okay, so without further ado, chapter 10, Boundaries in Your Children. Shannon couldn't stop crying. A young mother of two preschool children, she couldn't imagine herself being angry or out of control and certainly not abusive. Yet a week ago, she had picked up her three-year-old, Noah, and shaken him hard. She had screamed at him loudly, and it wasn't the first time. She had done it numerous times in the past year. The only difference was that this time, Shannon almost physically injured her son, and she was frightened. This experience had so shaken Shannon and her husband, Michael, that they called and made an appointment with me, John, to discuss what had happened. Her shame and guilt were intense. She avoided eye contact with me as she told her story. The several hours before Shannon had lost control with Noah um, had been terrible. Michael, her husband, and she had had an argument before breakfast. He had left for work without saying goodbye. Then, one-year-old Sophie spilled cereal all over the floor, and Noah, the three-year-old, chose that morning to do everything he'd been told not to do for the previous three years. He pulled the cat's tail, he figured out how to open the front door, and he ran outside into the yard and then into the street. He smeared Shannon's lipstick all over the white dining room wall, and he pushed Sophie to the floor. This last incident was the straw that broke Shannon's back. Seeing Sophie lying on the floor crying, with Noah standing over her, with a defiantly pleased look, was just too much. Shannon saw red and impulsively ran to her son. And, well, you know the rest of the story. After she had calmed down a little, I asked Shannon how she and Michael normally discipline Noah. Well, we don't want to alienate Noah or quench his spirit, Michael began. Being negative is so, so negative. We, we just try to reason with him. Sometimes we'll warn him that you'll get ice cream tonight if you behave. Sometimes we try to praise good things he does. And sometimes we try to ignore bad behavior. Then maybe he'll stop it. Doesn't he push the limits? I asked. Both parents nodded. You wouldn't believe it, Shannon said. It's like he doesn't hear us. He keeps on doing what he jolly well pleases, and generally he'll keep it up until one of us explodes and yells at him. I guess we just have a problem, child. Well, there's certainly a problem, I replied, but perhaps Noah has been trained not to respond to anything but out-of-control rage. Let's talk about boundaries and kids. Of all the areas in which boundaries are crucially important, none is more relevant than the raising of children. How we approach boundaries and child rearing will have an enormous impact on the characters of our kids, on how they develop values, on how well they do in school, on the friends they pick, on whom they marry, and on how well they do in a career. The importance of family. God, at his deepest level, is a lover. He is relationally oriented and relationally driven. He desires connection with us from womb to tomb. Quote, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Jeremiah 31, 3 says, God's loving nature isn't passive. It's active. Love multiplies itself. God, the relational lover, is also God, the aggressive creator. He wants to fill up his universe with beings who care for him and for each other. The family is the social unit God invented to fill up the world with representatives of his loving character. It's a place for nurturing and developing babies until they're mature enough to go out of the family as adults and to multiply his image in other surroundings. God first picked up the notion Israel, I'm sorry, picked up the nation Israel to be his children. After centuries of resistance by Israel, however, God chose the church. Because of Israel's transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. Romans 11 11 says, The body of Christ has the same role as Israel had to multiply God's love and character. The church is often described as a family. We are to do good, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. That's Galatians 6.10. Believers are members of God's household, Ephesians 2.19. We are to know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, says 1 Timothy 3.15. Lots of scripture today. 
These and many other powerful passages show us how God thinks family. He thinks family, literally. He explains his heart as a parent would. He's a daddy. He likes his job. This biblical portrayal of God helps show us how parenting is such a vital part of bringing God's own character to this planet in our little one's lives. Boundaries and Responsibility God, the good parent, wants to help us, his children, grow up. He wants to see us become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Part of this maturing process is helping us know how to take responsibility for our lives. It's the same with our own flesh and blood kids. Second only to learning how to bond, to form strong attachments, the most important thing parents can give children is a sense of responsibility. Knowing that they are responsible for and knowing what they aren't responsible for. Knowing how to say no and knowing how to accept no. Responsibility is a gift of enormous value. We've all been around middle-aged people who have the boundaries of an 18-month-old. They have tantrums or sulk when others set limits on them. Or they simply fold and comply with others just to keep the peace. Remember that these adult people started off as little people. They learned long, long ago to either fear or hate boundaries. The relearning process for adults is laborious. <laughs> Pointing the finger at myself. Instilling versus repairing boundaries. As a wise mother of adult children once watched her younger friend struggle with her youngster, um, Oh, I said that wrong. A wise mother of adult children once watched her younger friend struggle with her youngster. The child was refusing to behave, and the young mother was quickly losing her mind. Affirming the mother's decision to make the child sit on a chair by herself, the older woman said, Do it now, dear. Discipline the child now, and you might just survive adolescence. Developing boundaries in young children is that proverbial ounce of prevention. If we teach responsibility, limit setting, and delay of gratification early on, the smoother our children's later years of life will be. The later we start, the harder we and they have to work. If you're a parent of older children, don't lose heart. It just means boundary development will be met with more resistance. In their minds, they do not have a lot to gain by learning boundaries. You'll need to spend more time working on it, getting more support from friends, and praying harder. We'll review age-appropriate boundary tasks for the different stages of childhood later in this chapter. Boundary Development in Children The work of boundary development in children is the work of learning responsibility. As we teach them the merits and limits of responsibility, we teach them autonomy. We prepare them to take on the tasks of adulthood. The scriptures have much to say about the role of boundary setting in child rearing. Usually we call it discipline. The Hebrew and Greek words that scholars translate as discipline mean teaching. Yay! This teaching has both a positive and a negative slant. The positive facets of discipline are proactivity, prevention, and instruction. And seriously, I feel like I need to like highlight so much of this chapter. It's so good. Okay, the positive facets of discipline are proactivity, prevention, and instruction. Positive discipline is sitting children down to educate and train them in a task. Fathers are to raise their children in the training and instruction of the Lord, says Ephesians 6, 4. And the negative facets of discipline are correction, chastisement, and consequences. Negative discipline is letting children suffer the results of their actions to learn a lesson in Responsibility. Stern discipline awaits anyone who leaves the path. Isn't that the truth? Oh, good child rearing involves both preventative training and practice and correctional consequences. For example, you set a 10, year, 10 o'clock bedtime for your 14 year old. It's there so that you'll get enough sleep to be alert in school, you tell her. You've just disciplined positively. Then your team dawdles until 11.30. The next day you say, because you did not get to bed on time last night, you may not use the phone or the computer today. You've just disciplined negatively. 
Why are both positive and negative discipline necessary and good boundary development? Because God uses practice, trial and error, to help us grow up. We learn maturity by getting information, applying it poorly, making mistakes, learning from our mistakes, and doing it better next time. Practice is necessary in all areas of life, in learning to ski or to write an essay or to operate a computer. We need practice in boundary, I'm sorry, we need practice in developing a deep love relationship and in learning to study the Bible. And it's just as true in our spiritual and emotional growth. Oh my gosh. Seriously, guys, chapter 10. I'm like, I've gotta, I've gotta underline. This is so practical. This for me is the most practical chapter so far that we've read together. Okay, so th- what am I highlighting? Um, practice is necessary. We need practice in developing deep love relationships and learning to study the Bible, and it's just as true in our spiritual and emotional growth. And here's the quote. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves, constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. That's Hebrews 5.14. Practice is important in learning boundaries and responsibility. Our mistakes are our teachers. So good. Discipline is an external boundary designed to develop internal boundaries in our children. It provides a structure of safety until children have enough structure in their character not to need it. Good discipline always moves children toward more internal structure and more responsibility. We need to distinguish between discipline and punishment. Punishment is payment for wrongdoing. Legally, it's paying a penalty for breaking the law. Punishment doesn't leave a lot of room for practice, however. It is not a great teacher. The price is just too high. The wages of sin is death, says Romans 6.23. And whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it, says James 2.10. Punishment does not leave much room for mistakes. However, discipline is different. Discipline is not payment for a wrong. Instead, it's the natural law of God. Our actions reap consequences. Discipline is different from punishment because God isn't finished punishing us. Punishment ended on the cross for all those who accept Christ as Savior. Quote, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. 1 Peter 2, 24. Christ's suffering paid for our wrongdoing. That's so good. <laughs> That's so, so good. See, this is why I can work so hard on boundaries. Because I already know that I'm loved in Jesus. I already know that my eternity is secure. I already know that all the guilt, all the shame, all the I wish I hadn't done that or I did that and I shouldn't have, all that stuff has already been dealt with by Jesus. So because I have that foundation of love, I can look at the parts of myself that still need to grow, that still need to learn. And be like, okay, I'm all in. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is alive in me, so let's do this. <laughs> and that's why I can even look at this stuff. Otherwise, it would just be too painful. So if you're listening and you're not a Christian, you don't understand that, then please reach out to me in a private message. and We could talk more about how what Jesus did on the cross sets us free from the law of sin and death. That would be a great thing for us to talk about. All right, back to the book. In addition, discipline and punishment have a different relationship to time. Punishment looks back. It focuses on making payment for wrongs done in the past. Christ's suffering was payment, for example, for our sin. Discipline, however, looks forward. The lessons we learn from discipline help us not to make the same mistakes again. Quote, God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. That's Hebrews 12.10. How does that help us? It frees us to make mistakes without fear of judgment, without fear of loss of relationship. Quote, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1 says. The freedom of the cross allows us to practice without having to pay a terrible price. The only danger is consequences, not isolation and judgment. Take, for example, the mother who tells her 10-year-old, You smart off again, and I won't love you anymore. 
The youngster is immediately in a no-win situation. She can either rebel and lose the most important relationship in her life, or she can comply and become externally obedient, losing any chance of practicing confrontational skills. Now compare that response with this. I'll never stop loving you. That's a constant in my heart. However, if you smart off again, you'll lose your computer privileges for three days. The relationship is still intact in that way. There's no condemnation, and the child gets an opportunity to choose responsibility or suffer consequences with no risk of losing love and safety. This is the way to maturity, to learning to eat solid food, the safe practice of discipline. The boundary needs of children. What specific needs do boundaries meet in our kids? Limit setting abilities have several important jobs that will pay enormous dividends throughout life. Number one, self-protection. Have you ever seen anything more helpless than the human infant? Human babies are less able to take care of themselves than animal babies. God designed the newborn months as a means for the mother and father or another caregiver to connect deeply with their infant, knowing that without their minute by minute care, the baby would not survive. All this time and energy translates into an enduring attachment in which the child learns to feel safe in the world. God's program of maturation, however, doesn't stop there. Mom and dad can't always be there to care and provide. The task of protection needs to ultimately pass on to the children. When they grow up, they need to protect themselves. Boundaries are our way of protecting and safeguarding our souls. Boundaries are designed to keep the good in and the bad out. And skills such as saying no, telling the truth, and maintaining physical distance need to be developed in the family structure to allow the child to take on responsibility of self-protection. Considering, consider the following two 12-year-old boys. Jack is talking with his parents at the dinner table. Guess what? Some kids wanted me to smoke pot with them. When I told them I didn't want to, they said I was lame. I told them they were dumb. I like some of them, but if they can't like me because I don't smoke pot, I guess we aren't really friends. We, I guess they aren't really my friends. Now another young man, Tyler, comes home after school with red eyes, slurred speech, and coordination difficulties. When asked by his concerned parents what is wrong, he denies everything until finally he blurts out, Everybody's doing it! Why do you hate my friends? Both Jack and Tyler come from Christian homes with lots of love and an adherence to biblical values. So why did they turn out so differently? Jack's family allowed disagreements between parent and child and gave him practice in the skill of boundary setting, even with them. Jack's mom would be holding and hugging her two-year-old when he would get fidgety. He'd say, down, meaning, give me a little breathing space, ma. Fighting her own impulses to hold onto her child, she would let him down on the floor and say, want to play with your trucks? Oh, that is so good, guys. Even now, I have to fight the, re the urge to uh, hug my teenagers when they don't want it, and I have to respect their no. <laughs> and say, okay, all right, I'll let you go. Or I won't even hug you because um, I want to respect your no. Okay, Jack's dad. Jack's dad used the same philosophy. When wrestling with his son on the floor, he tried to pay attention to Jack's limits. When the going got too rough, or when Jack was tired, he could say, stop, daddy, and dad would get up. They'd, know, they'd go to another game. Jack was receiving boundary training. He was learning that when he was scared, in discomfort, or wanted to change things, he could say no. This little word gave him a sense of power in his own life. It took him out of a helpless or compliant position, and Jack could say it without receiving any angry or hurt response, or a manipulative counter move such as, but Jack, mommy wants to hold you now, okay? Oh my gosh, see, I'm so guilty of this. Jack learned from infancy on that his boundaries were good and that he could use them to protect himself. He learned to resist things that weren't good for him. 
A hallmark of Jack's family was permission to disagree. When, for example, Jack would fight his parents about his bedtime, they never withdrew or punished him for disagreeing. Instead, they would listen to his reasoning, and if it seemed appropriate, they would change their minds. If not, they would maintain their boundaries. Jack was also given, okay, so just a note, like I've gotten better and better at that, at listening and and, uh, changing my expectations if what my children are asking for is reasonable. And that has been one of the greatest gifts of um, parenting, I think, is being able to model them that just because I have a certain opinion about something doesn't mean that um, it can't be changed with reason. All right, Um, Jack was also given a vote in some family members. When family night out would come up, his parents listened to his opinion on whether they should go to a movie, play video games, or shoot baskets in the driveway. Was this a family with no limits? On the contrary, it was a family who took boundary setting seriously as a skill to develop in its children. This was good practice for resisting in the evil day. Ephesians 5.16 says, when some of Jack's friends turned on him and pressured him to take drugs. How was Jack able to refuse? Because by then he'd had 10 or 11 years of practicing disagreeing with people who were important to him without losing their love. He didn't fear abandonment in standing up against his friends. He'd done it many times successfully with his family with no loss of love. Tyler, on the other hand, had come from a different family setting. In his home, no had two different responses. His mom would be hurt and withdraw and pout. She would send guilt messages such as, how can you say no to your mom who loves you? His dad would get angry, threaten him, and say things like, don't talk back to me, mister. It didn't take long for Tyler to learn that to have his way, he had to be externally compliant. He developed a strong yes on the outside, seeming to agree with his family's values and control. Whatever he thought on about a subject, the dinner menu, I can't talk. Whatever he thought about a subject, the dinner menu, social media restrictions, church activities, clothes or curfews, he stuffed it all inside. Once when he had tried to resist his mother's hug, she had immediately withdrawn from him, pushing him away with the words, Someday you'll feel sorry for hurting your mother's feelings like that. Day by day, Tyler was being trained not to set limits. As a result of his learned boundarylessness, Tyler seemed to be a content, respectful son. The teens, however, are a crucible for kids. We find out what kind of character has actually been built into our children during this difficult passage. Tyler folded. He gave in to his friend's pressure. It isn't any, is it any wonder that the first people he said no to were his parents at 12 years old? Resentment and the years of not having boundaries were beginning to erode the compliant, easy to live with, false self he had developed to survive. Pretty intense stuff. That's the, um, Stopping point on page 177. If when you have been watching this, you have any questions about boundaries or how you can get my little boundaries cheat sheet, I'd be happy to email it to you. Feel free to send me a private message and happy new year, everybody. There are new beginnings with Jesus every day over and over again. And especially as we learn how to love well in our journey to healthy boundaries. Have a great night and a happy new year. Bye-bye.